Welcome back to ESSA TV. Joining us today, from England, is Professor Stephen Dobson. Professor Dobson has been teaching economics across the globe since 1984, having joined his current employer, Hull University, in 2011. His research interests are applied economics, the economics of sport, and the economics of developing countries. He is a member of the editorial boards of the Journal of Sports Economics and the International Journal of Sports Finance, and a research fellow at the National Centre for Econometric Research here in Australia. He has published a book titled The Economics of Football, alongside Professor John Goddard. Professor Dobson is originally from Leicester and is a lifelong fan of Leicester City FC, who of course took out the 2015-16 Premier League title. Professor Dobson, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. The Championship Playoff Final is commonly referred to as the richest game in football, with the winner being promoted to the top flight English Premier League, whilst the loser remains a division below in the EFL Championship. Can you run through the significance of this match, for viewers who may be unaware of it, and also the financial divide between these two divisions? The Playoff Final this year um, saw Huddersfield Town promoted to um, the Premier League. And uh, the estimates are that this will benefit the club by around about £170 million over three seasons, even if Huddersfield was to get relegated back to the championship at the end of, of this season. And most of that money is coming through... Um, the broadcasting rights deal that um, the Premier League negotiates with um, the key broadcasters in the UK of live live football, um, and for this season, all the clubs um, share the amount of money evenly. So, um, even if you finish bottom of the Premier League this season you end up getting about £95 million pounds, um, from that that deal. And for every place that you finish above bottom in, in the league, there's an extra £2 million pounds, um, added on to that um, base value. So um, if Huddersfield was to survive in the Premier League for three seasons, then they'd be getting a lot more than 170 million. They'd be getting around about 290 million. Um, if they get relegated, then there are things called parachute payments, which mean it's a form of protection for a Premier League team that's relegated to the championship. Um, and I'm not sure of the exact figures, but I think the parachute payments are something like 75 million pounds for, for two seasons. So if Huddersfield go down at the end of this season, they'll get um, £75 million times two um, to sort of cushion their, their, their fall from the Premier League. Um, so there's a lot of money riding on that, that Premier League, uh, that champ championship playoff final. Uh, and if you look at the uh, amount of income that, clubs in the Premier League receive on average compared to the average championship team. Um, for the data that's most recently been published, which uh, covers the 2015-2016 season, if you looked at the data for the 2015-2016 season, um, an average Premier League club um, has a revenue of about £182 million pounds, um, in that season, whereas an average championship team had a revenue of about £23 million. So we're looking at an average Premier League team being about eight times richer than the average um, championship team. And of course, if you then sum all the revenues of all the clubs in the Premier League and compare that to the sum in the in the Championship, then for that particular season I mentioned, um, the Premier League had a had an overall income of over £300 
three and a half billion pounds. Whereas for the championship as a whole, the total revenue was about 560 million pounds. So again, massive differences in in the wealth of the of the two two divisions within the uh, within the league structure within within English professional football. A financial divide is also evident within the Premier League, as rich sides such as Manchester United, Manchester City and Chelsea often battle it out for the title. This is what makes Leicester's title, as 5,000 to 1 outsiders at the start of the 2015-16 season, all the more special. Do you believe we will ever see another fairy tale story like Leicester's? Or is the divide between Europe's richest and poorest top flight clubs growing too large for this to happen again? If I was rational, I would say that um, it's unlikely that we'll see a repeat of of um, Leicester's incredible um, achievement um, any time soon. I think we'll be moving back towards um, a sort of e- equilibrium that that um, Leicester uh, disrupted. And, and as a Leicester City fan, I you know still. T- sinking in that we actually did win the Premier League almost 18 months later. Um, um, and a, to win a Premier League with longer odds than you had of finding Elvis Presley alive on the moon, um, it just shows how incredible that achievement was. Um, if you look at the data on um, how much teams spend on, on player wages and you correlate that with... Um, finishing position in the Premier League. If you go back over the times when which data is available for both those things, you see quite a strong correlation between spending on player wages and league position, a strong positive correlation. Um, So Leicester's achievement was rather, was a bit of a one-off because I think for that season, Um, If you looked at the wage bill for Leicester City, it was about the 15th largest wage bill. So you would not have then expected the club with the 15th largest wage bill um, to uh, finish Premier League champions. So it it really was a a, a massive outlier in, in, in terms of what we tend to see. We tend to see the teams that spend the most on players. top football players earn so much money? That's not easily answered, but um, given that my background is is, is, on, is, is in economics, I, I, I tend to look at these things from from the viewpoint of, uh, of an economist. And I think if you look at the salaries of the superstar players, I mean, they are sort of astronomical salaries. If you look at the, the, the salaries that Messi gets, you look at Ronaldo's salary. I mean, it, it's not just it's not just their sort of like basic pay from playing football, but it's all the other money that that, that that's associated with it, the endorsements, the bonuses, um, the sponsorship deals and so on. So the figures are, are quite scary, and especially when you compare them, you know, to the average salaries of, of 
people who are doing what you might consider more useful jobs like nurses, teachers, police officers. Um, and I think from an economic economics point of view, to try and understand why these salaries are so large, you sort of tend to look at it in terms of, well, if a club is willing to pay, say, 50 million pounds or 50 million euros to Messi, then logically he must be generating revenues for Barcelona of around about 50 million euros because if he's not generating that much extra income for the club, then the club is going to be making a big loss on paying him uh, a salary that's so high. So if it's about these players having this uh, incredible uh, ability to generate massive amounts of revenue for their team, then the question you then look at is, well, how do they manage to generate so much um, extra revenue for the team? And and there's a uh, there's quite a lot of analysis done on on how that might work, and it's along the lines that well, um, you have to look at how much more money is the average spectator willing to pay to see a top player, and how many spectators in total are willing to pay that extra amount to see a top player and you can sort of show that there's a sort of logical argument as to why it would be that the very very top players the number one in their field can uh, can generate uh, very very large audiences or very large volumes of, 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 of spectators and also, they, these spectators are willing to pay that extra amount to see the very top performer in that in that field. So I think you you can look at it uh, that way. And the way that technology has changed over the years, it's been much easier for these top players, these star players, to actually um, show their skills on a world stage through the advent of the internet, pay television. And whatever, so you can supply this service uh, to a vast audience at relatively low cost, and that's changed things fundamentally to the days before pay television, before the internet, before there was this easy way of demonstrating, uh, if you like, the superstar talents to a mass audience. So I think I think it's got things to do with that technology. It's got. It's got to do with people's willingness to pay to see the very best and large quantities of people being willing to pay to see the very best. And these days with free movement of players and competitive markets and people bidding for the player's services, that revenue that the, the player is generating is now going into the player's pocket, whereas in days before, it used to be going into the pockets of the team owners because the players didn't used to have freedom of movement. They didn't used to be what we call free agents. Clubs could keep players uh, uh, until they were ready to, leave, to, to release them. So I think that extra revenue that the players are generating and the ability of the players to keep that revenue for themselves has meant a massive increase in their salaries. How important is the manager to a team's success? And how might you assess a manager's quality? Drawing on research that um, I'm sort of familiar with, if you were to try and sort of estimate or measure uh, the contribution that a manager is making to a team's success, then I guess you could initially say, well, okay, let's look at... Um, Let's look at some performance measure for the team, whether that be the team's league position at the end of a season or whether we calculate performance in some other way, such as calculating a team's win percentage for a season or its win ratio. Um, if you have a measure of, out, uh, of performance like that and then you say, OK, well, surely I might think that the main determinant of that performance is going to be the quality of the team. So if I can measure the quality of the team in some way, I can then 
look to see what's the relationship between that team quality measure and the end performance measure. And I think if you do that, you get quite a strong relationship, as you would expect, and you probably find that about 80% of the variation in the performance from year to year is being explained by variations in the, the team quality. So therefore, you might conclude, well, that probably says, well, around about 20% then, maybe that's, maybe that's the contribution of the manager. It's not quite that, though, because there are sort of random factors that will affect a team's performance, not only within a season, but from season to season. You know, you, there, there's bad luck, there's injuries that you're not accounting for, there's player suspensions that you, you didn't necessarily account for. So there's some randomness to this. But if you say, well, around about 20% might be the manager's contribution, and that contribution might be both direct and indirect, the direct contribution might be the manager's ability to uh, play with the right tactics or select the right team or powers to motivate the players. But then there might be an indirect contribution of a manager that if he's working with players over time, he's going to enhance the skills of those players. They, they're going to be coached into becoming better players. So there are both direct and indirect contributions. Identifying or separating those two things out is, is not easy because you can't easily quantify that without having uh, available data on, on those things. So what, um, what I've been involved in over the years with some co-researchers has been looking at um, if we think about contribution in that way, can we get an idea of, of, of which managers have been the best at converting uh, player playing quality into, into team performance outcomes, whether it be league positions or, or wins? So in a sense, what you're trying to do in economics jargon is measure the efficiency of the manager. How good is the manager at... Um, taking a given team quality and converting that team quality into into wins. Um, and there are ways of, of doing that. So you can you have these statistical models that say, okay, if we can measure the quality of, of the team at the start of the season, um, given that quality, how many wins would we expect that team to achieve by the end of that season? given the quality of the team. And then you can compare the predicted number of wins with the actual number of wins, and that gives you a, 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 an estimate of how efficient, if you like, the manager is in using the resources he's got available to convert that into team success. Um, and you get quite big variations in, in manager, uh, manager efficiency scores. Um, and the interesting is some of the big name managers over the years haven't done particularly well if you calculate their efficiency in this way. Um, I remember doing a study years ago where we had, you know, this was uh, 25, 30 years of data, lots of managers. Uh, Alex Ferguson was the sort of main manager in England fo English football at the time, the manager of Manchester United, and he never came out particularly well in these um, rankings, even though, you know, the, the pundits would be basically say that Ferguson was the best manager. He didn't come out particularly well because what the model was doing was finding that given the quality of the playing resources that he had, um, he should have actually generated more wins than he actually did. So because he didn't generate as many wins as it would have been predicted, then he didn't gain uh, such a high efficiency score. So, um, you know, again, it's a long, it, it, it's quite a detailed type of analysis because there are arguments about how do you measure team quality and probably haven't got time to go into that but there are ways of there are ways of estimating the quality of a team at the start of the season and then using that data to try and predict how well the team ought to do at the end of that season um, and then looking at the difference between predicted wins and actual wins and seeing that as the manager's contribution. Are football referees really biased and inconsistent, or is this just a myth perpetuated by frustrated fans? I can draw on uh, research that I've been involved in myself on, on this, um, and 
basically the answer is, from the research I've been involved in, uh, the evidence from the studies that we carried out would suggest that uh, referees uh, do exhibit um, home team bias, and they are inconsistent. But we could not say that this is any sort of deliberate action on the part of referees because we were not carrying out research by looking at the behavior of individual referees in some sort of uh, video analysis or anything like that. What we did was we looked at, we had a very large data set of, um, the, uh, of yellow and red cards that had been awarded in, um, in English Premier League games uh, over about um, 20 seasons. And we basically looked at the awards of the yellow and red cards in, in all of these league games. And we tried to see if there were particular patterns in the in the incidence of of the awards of these cards. Other researchers have looked at other me other metrics. Other re other researchers have looked at um, the number of fouls that are um, given in games, or they've looked at the amount of time that was added on at the end of games to see whether there's any difference in in in, in those in those um, times. Uh, these are the home teams, away teams. So uh, we looked at the incidence of yellow and red cards in a very large data set. And what we were thinking about was, well, if you look at the data, what you see, which is not surprising, I guess, is that away teams receive a lot more yellow cards and a lot more red cards than home teams. Now, you might argue, well, that's fairly easy to explain because it's going to be to do with home advantage effects. Because if you look at uh, any game, the home team tends to attack more than the away team on average. The away team tends to do more defending. The away team tends to commit more tackles and, and fouls. So it's not surprising, therefore, that you would expect the away team to pick up more yellow and red cards. So what we were having to do was to say, OK, even if you allow for a home advantage effect, um, we were able to do that by looking at uh, the relative quality of the two teams contesting a match. So we looked at games where the home team was a relatively weak team as measured by its league position at the time of the game. And the away team was a relatively strong team. So if you looked at matches where you'd got relatively weak home teams playing against relatively strong away teams, we were looking to see uh, whether there was still a tendency for the away teams to pick up more yellow and red cards. So having tried to control for the home advantage effect, what we found is that um, away teams did tend to receive more yellow and red cards. And so we argued that that was um, evidence that there was home team bias in the, uh, in the award of the cards. And we also found that if you then looked at individual referees, um, in the data set and looking at their their sort of um, tendency to award red, yellow and red cards, we found that there was quite significant variation um, across referees, sort of inferring that there's, there's some inconsistency there. And we also found that uh, referees were, uh, they varied in their degree of home team bias. So some referees tended to favor the home team much more than others. Um, so I think what we found was statistical evidence in this very large data set on yellow and red cards, statistical evidence of, of home team bias, statistical evidence of refereeing inconsistency. But we were not able to conclude from that that uh, any of this bias was in any way intentional. Um, so we, we presume it was unintentional, but it's something that is something that comes up when it's something that you see in the in the data quite clearly. And again, this research is quite statistical in its in its in its nature, um, uh, and I'm hopefully trying to summarise quite uh, quite a lot of work in, uh, in in quite a quite a short time. I don't know whether there are studies being done now. I think by some sports scientists maybe where they're actually observing referees more closely and trying to come up with 
other ways of capturing biasness and, and inconsistency. But ours wasn't about actually watching referees. It was actually by saying, okay, well, there's this massive amount of data. We've got referees in there. We've got yellow and red cards. We've got all sorts of things. We can actually disentangle some of these things and see if we can find patterns in this data and therefore see if we can find statistical support for these ideas. Our results said it's not really a myth, um, but we, we certainly couldn't establish any motivation on the part of referees. All we were able to do in our research was sort of give sort of advice to the authorities that maybe they, you know, when they talk to the referees, they highlight some of these um, some of these issues. But, you know, this research was a few years ago, and even now, well, at the start of the new season in England, you're already seeing numerous examples of where it appears that referees are applying uh, the law in different ways and using different degrees of discretion. Um, so I don't know, you know what the answer is to, to that, to sort of appease the fans or convince the fans that referees really are, you know, um, neutral in every sense. Um, but it's, it's an interesting research field, I think, and there's, there's probably a lot more a lot more that can be done. We also did a little bit of work of comparing referees in different European leagues to see if there were any any differences there. And we, we basically found similar similar results if you compared uh, the big five um, European leagues. Uh, and we were looking there at things like whether nationality made any difference because obviously referees from different countries, whether cultural differences might have been, been behind things or... So anyway, it's, it, there's a lot there's a lot that still could be done there, I think. It would be remiss of me if I didn't ask for your take on Australian football. How is Australian football perceived overseas, both with regards to the Socceroos and the Hyundai A-League, our domestic competition? Obviously, this is entirely my own opinion. I'm not speaking for anyone else because I don't have any, I don't have any evidence. Um, uh, so basically, from my own point of view, you may know that we get um, we get the uh, league games shown live. Um, I think this season uh, they're being shown on BT Sport. I think the season starts pretty soon, as far as I'm, yes, I'm aware. That, that's correct. I think cause I think we're, I've seen some adverts on the I've seen some adverts on one of their sports channels that uh, that they'll be showing the games this season. Um, I, I personally don't get a chance to watch. Um, a lot of football, nowhere near as much as I would like to because um, I, I seem to not actually own my own TV set in this house. So um, so although I'd like to see a lot more games, I don't seem to be able to get access to my own television very often because uh, the members of the household are sort of occupying it. So I would like to see more. I know that the, that the league is being shown on one of the main uh, pay TV providers. Um, I have no numbers on um, viewing figures or anything like that, so I can't I can't tell you how how popular it is. Um, but I think from the games I've seen, there's obviously you know it's a, there's reasonably good product. Um, but I can't say anything more than than that in terms of you know how much it's sort of um, being followed and how much do people discuss the Australian league. My anecdotal evidence is not a great amount. Uh, most people are focusing on how their club has done in the Premier League or the Championship or whatever when you talk to people on a Monday morning, you know, over coffee. Um, the the national team obviously it's, uh, got a playoff game coming up, I think, against Syria. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be a big uh, a big occasion. Um, obviously, there are the Australian players playing in England, so people know some of the current players who are playing in England, certainly if they play for your team, and obviously there's been some very big name players going back a few years who, who, who've played in uh, played in England uh, with some of the big teams. So I think uh, there's a sort of, you know, there's an affection for it, and I, my own personal affection is, probably shouldn't say this, is more for the Kiwis, um, because I used to live in New Zealand. Um, so although, although the, the New Zealand team is not strong, they have managed to to get to a couple of World Cups, so it's always good to good to see the smaller teams managing to to put up a good fight against the uh, the bigger teams. So I'm hoping uh, 
you know, the Socceroos get through the playoffs and it'd be good to see them at the World Cup. It always brightens it up. It always, and I think, you know, you, you don't want a World Cup where, you know, it's just the elite group of teams playing each other over and over again. I think what makes the World Cup for most average fans is the fact that they, they see teams that they don't normally see or they see players that they don't see see very often. And I think it makes it much more of, a, uh, of an interesting interesting tournament. New Zealand, of course, um, also have a playoff game coming up, I, th- I believe, in November against the South American fifth-ranked team, which at the moment is Argentina, or it could very well even be Chile, yeah, who is yeah, sixth I, at the I, moment. Yeah, I looked at that. I know Argentina are struggling, and um, that would be obviously a massive game if um, if it turned out to be Argentina against New Zealand. I always feel as though it's a little bit hard for the Kiwis when you have to play, um, you know, the team from the South American uh, tournament because most of those teams there are pretty good, even if they don't automatically qualify. So I don't know whether there's a way a way around that, but um, I don't think the Kiwis are overly bothered because when I lived there, nobody was really interested in soccer anyway. If you mentioned soccer, you were seen, sort of seeing, well, what's wrong with you? What about rugby? What about football? Mm-hmm. What about football? Sorry, as it was uh, as it was called. Um, so I, I remember ca- correcting my New Zealand colleagues and saying, "Well, if you're going to say football, we're talking about the round ball game. We're not talking about the oval ball game." But of course, it was just a little bit of banter that we used to have. Completely on your side there. Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, as I said, football is a round ball game, and every time I see a New Zealander, I have to keep reminding them that it's a round ball game. You call football. Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, that's been great. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.